Okay, we're going to talk about Flickr today. And we have to first define Flickr, of course. Uh, the CIE has an international lighting vocabulary. That's what uh, ILV stands for. And they have four different Flickr terms that they describe. Uh, one is an overarching term called temporal lighting artifacts, which is an undesirable change in perceived light level induced by temporal light modulation. So what they're trying to do is to separate the stimulus, which is temporal light modulation, that's oscillating light coming off of a light source, from temporal light artifacts, which is the perception of the change in lighting. They also define three flavors of flicker. The first one is called flicker. Flicker is the perception of visual and steadiness, for a static observer in a static environment. So if you're in standing still, your eyes are not moving, you're focused at a light source, and your eyes never go through any major saccades, and you're seeing something unsteady, that's flicker. How often does that happen? Not very often. Uh, but that kind of flicker can be very dangerous because that ranges between, if it ranges between about 3 hertz up to 70 hertz, that can be the source of uh, stimulus that can cause epileptic re reactions. Uh, but that is flicker. That's a very low frequency oscillation in light output. Then there's the stroboscopic effect, which starts at about 80 hertz. And hertz means that the light basically goes from high light level to low light level 80 times per second. That's what 80 hertz means. Uh, the stroboscopic effect is the change of perceived motion as a result of a static observer and a moving object or light source. Then there's a third form of flicker called the phantom array effect, which is also called the ghost effect. And that's a change in perception that is due to basically a light source that is tracking across your field of view as a result of a change in eye movement relative to the light source. So as you see, what they're doing here is defining the relative movement between your view and the object and the light source. If there's relative movement there, then it's not technically called flicker, it's technically called a stroboscopic effect or the phantom array effect. And then the IEEE 1789 committee uh, worked on a standard for about seven years uh, and they define flicker additionally as all visual and non-visual effects as measured by EEG testing. So what that standard was saying, whether you see it or not, it may be affecting your brain. Your brain may be picking up the change in light output, even though you're not aware of it. So we now have all the definitions under our belt. And now I'm going to ask Bob to turn off all the lights. And anyone who has a history of seizures, I am not kidding. I do not want you to watch this. So if you have any history of seizures, put your head down and cover your eyes, seriously. Okie doke. We're going to talk about three different flavors of flicker. This is classic flicker. There we go. This is classic flicker. You should be able to see it by looking directly at the spot that is oscillating in light output. And that's flickering, oh, it'll tell me here. I think it's at 50 hertz. Yes. Fift excuse me. No, this is 15 hertz with a square wave. So now you have that. Let's disconnect that. We're now going to go into the stroboscopic effect. And I'm going to use my handy dandy flicker checker here. And I'm first going to show you 
Something that doesn't flicker. How's that? These are just different PAR 30 lamps. And I'll show it here against my black background. You're probably seeing a smooth fan of light as I wave the scale, correct? OK, you're in for a treat. I'll show you a lamp that I discovered recently, thinking that it wasn't going to flicker, and guess what? No, we'll get it. You'll probably see some bars. Instead of it being a smooth fan of light, there are bars in that. This lamp emits about 20% flicker, which means the uh, change in the difference between its maximum output and minimum output is about 20% of the total of the maximum output and minimum output. So let's go to the one that's really my favorite. Come on. This one's seriously bad. This is 100% flicker, which means that it goes from full output to zero, in this case, 120 times per second. So this is pretty nasty stroboscopic effect. <coughs> and then I'm going to show you what the phantom array effect looks like. And I'm hoping you're going to be able to see it. Where is it? It's over here. <coughs> you know what rabbit tracks in the snow look like, correct? It's discrete footprints that track across the snow. The phantom array effect does the same thing. And as I wave this in space, I'm hoping you're seeing a lot of little discrete dots. You're not seeing a smooth fan of light, right? Say yes. What's that? Dark area. Dark area, like here? Are you all seeing that? That's the phantom array effect. Now, there's a lot of difference in perception. Some people will see it, some people won't. And that's part of the reason why flicker is such a nasty phenomenon. It's not as though we can all agree on, oh, that's horrible, because some people will say, oh, that's wretched, I'm going to get a headache as a result of being underneath this. And some people will say, I have no trouble, I can't see it at all. So it's a big problem. So the important factors of flicker we are looking here at different waveforms that take place over about um, uh, a little less than a second. And the, uh, the factors that contribute are first frequency. How fast is it turning on and off? And in general, the lower the frequency, the more visible it's going to be. So frequency of uh, in, measured in cycles per second. The most common frequency of flicker we're going to see in the United States is twice the mains uh, frequency, which it, mains frequency is 60 hertz in this country. So you double that, you're going to see 120 hertz. That's most common. That's what you saw from all of these, as a matter of fact. You saw 120 hertz flicker. Modulation depth is how much that light output is changing from maximum to minimum divided by the maximum plus the minimum. That's the definition. The duty cycle for square waves, which basically says it's the percent of time in a cycle, like one second, that the light source is on as opposed to off. Or some people define duty cycle as the percentage of time that the light is at a high light level versus a low light level, not necessarily off. Depends who you talk to. And the reason that's important is that if you have, if you're using pulse width modulation to reduce the, the output of a light source, uh, you can basically turn that light source off for one tenth of the time that it's on, and you will see that light source emitting on the average 
90% of its light output. And that's not as noticeable as if you dim it down to, say, 10% of its light output. If the light source is only on 10% of the time, you're going to see that smaller percent of the light output as flicker more easily than if it's 90% of the time. So next one is um, uh, the relative motion of the light source relative to your eyes. If you're working on a steady task and your eyes aren't moving very much, you're probably not going to be picking up flicker as much as if you're like me, where your eyes are darting around the room. Now, unless you're a patient etherized on a table, most of the time your eyes are moving. Because even when you're reading, your eyes are going through saccades, you know, jumping across a line of text, for example. And even that is often enough to pick up certain kinds of flicker. So to some extent, I find the definitions of flicker where, you know, your eyes are not moving and the light source is not moving. Well, when does that ever happen? Not very often. So I find some of these kind of specious. Does it matter whether the light source is moving or your eye is moving? No, you've got, you've got relative motion between the two. So that's what's important to me personally. Light intensity and observer adaptation level makes a difference, and here's how. Um, there are certain kinds of flicker that drive me absolutely bonkers. I just happen to be personally sensitive to flicker. And I find that if I'm in an environment like a landscape lighting environment where the light levels are quite low, I don't pick it up. So we know that under low light levels, you're less likely to be bothered or distracted or disturbed by that flicker. At this point in time, we don't really have hard numbers to apply to that. But in general, maybe outdoor lighting under low light levels, you know, under a foot candle or so, uh, 10 lux, may be something that we worry about less than higher light levels. And the last one is the shape of the waveform. Uh, if the waveform is sinusoidal, theoretically it's less noticeable. There's a sinusoidal wave up there in the upper right. That's less noticeable than a square waveform, which you would see uh, on the upper left there. So as soon as you see sharp edges in the waveform, you may be more likely to see it. So those are the factors that contribute to the visibility or detection of flicker. Here are the factors that will impact health. If you're exposed to this flickering light source for a longer period of time, it's more likely to cause some kind of physiological response. If it's brighter, it's more likely to give you a physiological response. If the area of the visual field that's being stimulated is larger, that's more likely to cause a response. If both eyes are being stimulated, then that's worse than if one eye is being stimulated. And then there's the position in the visual field. If it's located near your center of view, your axis of view, it's more likely to cause a response, a neurological response. And contrast with the background. More contrast is worse. So it's a very, if it's a very light difference, uh, in, well, here's an example. Um, one of the ways that I personally pick up flicker is when there's a flickering light source in my field of view and there's a high contrast edge. Let's say it's this black edge against this white projected screen. And as I'm moving my eyes around, I kind of pick out sequential edges. They're like trailing arrows and the old fashioned Microsoft cursors, if you're old enough to remember that, that drove everybody bonkers and then Microsoft changed them. Well, that sharp edge, that high contrast edge, will make the flicker more noticeable. A soft contrast won't allow you to pick it up as easily. And then the color of the flash. Uh, red is worse. And you can have color contrast that can trigger a, a, a 
seizure response, for example. Does anyone remember a few years ago there was a Japanese cartoon that caused several hundred Japanese kids to go to the emergency room? It was, you can look it up on, the, uh, on YouTube with lots of warnings if you have seizures, don't watch this. But it was a color contrast between, I think between red and blue, uh, an oscillation, I think it was a Pokemon cartoon. So yes, you remember that, Nancy? So look it up. Um, yes, so that's another issue that can cause problems. Why do we care? The first one we care about is photoepilepsy, which is uh, people having seizures as a result of seeing flashing lights and other repetitive patterns. In fact, it turns out that people who are likely to have seizures are also bothered by stripes in the environment. And one of the common stripes that people don't like are the stripes on the treads of escalator stairs. Do any of you have any problems with those? If you've ever had sensitivity with stripes and said, whoa, that shirt's a little loud, you may be more sensitive to uh, the neurological response from flicker. Uh, the stroboscopic effect is very dangerous if you're working with moving machinery because it can make the machinery look like it's moving at a different rate or not at all. So if you have machinery that is rotating and it looks like it's still and you stick your hand into it, this is a big problem. So you don't want to have flicker around moving machinery. Migraine or severe paroxysmal headache. Paroxysmal, I had to look it up multiple times. It means um, a sudden attack uh, and, and it might be a repetitive uh, response. This, this migraine or visual response is often associated with nausea and visual disturbances. Uh, those of you who get migraines my heart goes out to you because they're very difficult to deal with and they're so debilitating. People who get migraines also tend to be more sensitive to flicker. Autists, people who have autism, tend, in, in the literature it's said that they uh, have increased repetitive behaviors when they're in the presence of flicker. Uh, one theory that I saw is that the flicker may be increasing the stimulation that they're receiving in an environment. So that is maybe the reason for that response. Uh, eye strain, fatigue, blurred vision, conventional headaches, all that good stuff, those can be aggravated by flicker. Some people have panic attacks or anxiety attacks, vertigo, as a result of flicker. Or sometimes flicker can be just one of the triggers that can cause that kind of a response. Now, how many of you have had problems with LEDs where you've had video equipment in the spaces? I'm surprised no one has raised their hand. This is, oh, there are a few, okay. It'll be interesting to see how those demonstrations show up in the, the video uh, that's being taken right now. Because the video frame rates may not, may or may not coincide with the flicker rates and as a result you may see lines or you may see weird effects happening in the video. In a lot of video conference spaces, lighting designers have to do very careful testing to make sure that they either have very low flicker uh, rates of flicker from the light sources or make sure it's carefully paired with the video camera that's being used. The IEEE P1789 committee, isn't, doesn't, it really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> Just call it the Flickr folks. That was formed in 2008 to research the issue, and it was focused on the health issues, the health risks of Flickr from solid state lighting, and to rem come up with a recommended practice to uh, battle it and they developed a risk assessment procedure in 2012. And it basically is a chart that looks like this, that allows you to look at the kinds of harm that can result from flicker and where they occur on the severity and probability chart. So for example, photosensitive seizures, very rare. Uh, people with, 
that get seizures uh, as a result of Flickr, maybe one in 4,000, it may be even fewer than that. But when it happens, it can be very severe. Seizures are a serious issue, so you don't want that to happen. So even though it's very rare, it's down here in the corner, avoid it. And the other thing, stroboscopic effect, they, depending on whether it's moving machinery, it can be catastrophic, for example. Uh, but the probability of it happening is probably low to very low. So this is just a way to evaluate the different kinds of problems that can happen from Flickr and evaluate the severity. So where do we care? We care in general lighting because remember we said that uh, if the lighting fills your full field of view, it's worse, it affects you worse than if it's a localized task light, it, for example. So anything, any general lighting we want to be uh, aware of uh, because it fills the full field of view. But we also care about task lighting because we also said if the flicker is localized in an area and you're concentrating on that area, that's uh, basically putting flicker into the fovea and you can have a greater response from that than if it's kind of distributed slightly around the fovea. So task lighting's a problem. Industrial spaces for obvious reasons, video conference rooms for obvious reasons, Classrooms. Why classrooms? Because you have people who get headaches. And headaches are very debilitating, and they are a source of tremendous loss of productivity in this country and other countries. Same thing with offices. We care because headaches are so prevalent. Why is it relevant? You have to understand that almost all light sources emit some level of flicker. So flicker is not necessarily bad. However, depending on the degree of flicker and the frequency of that flicker, it can be bad. So just as some examples, we're looking at waveforms there of a classic halogen MR16. Do you see there's a little 120 hertz ripple on the top of the light output, which means the light is very steady and it's just oscillating in output by about 6%. Uh, same thing with the A19. How many people remember old magnetically ballasted fluorescent fixtures that everyone hated? This is what those produce. That's about 27, 28% flicker. And that's what everybody hated. So that's kind of a baseline that we want to be better than this. <coughs> when you go to a, an electronic ballast, that increases the frequency. So you may be operating at, say, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 60,000 hertz. And at that point, the brain is no longer able to pick up those rapid frequencies. So this is an electronically ballasted CFL, for example. And you'll see that there's a little teeny ripple on top, but basically the frequency is so fast that there's, it doesn't even register in the plot here. Why do we care? Because of dimming, among other reasons. As soon as you introduce dimming, the flicker can get worse. Uh, lighting is about perception. And we all know that when you dim down a light source by 50%, does it look like you have 50% of the light output? No, sirree, Bob. No, Eric, no. I've told you this a million times, no. When you dim down to 50% on a linear scale, it actually looks like it's emitting about 20% of the light output, and it gets worse from there. As soon as you dim down below 50%, it looks like the amount of light is surprisingly high, even though you're dimming it down to very low levels. Here are three different equations for uh, that phenomenon, looking at uh, the brightness depending on the, the depth of dimming that's going on. To get a light source to look like it's dimmed to 10% output, you actually need to dim it down to 1% output. So, okay, we're all designing a conference room and we say, oh, 10% dimming is fine. Well, <laughs> no, it's not. Because 10% dimming looks like it's more like 
30 or 40 percent dimming. If you want to get it to look like 10 percent of the light, you have to dim down to 1 percent. And as soon as you're at those very low levels, you start having issues with an LED light source. Why? Because when you are reducing the level of the light source, depending on how you dim, you're maybe turning the LED on and off very rapidly in order to dim. And LEDs have no persistence. Incandescent had persistence. You turn the light off and that incandescent glow fades over a short period of time. Same thing with fluorescent lamps. You turn it off in a dark room and you can see the glow diminishing. There's some persistence there. LEDs do not have persistence unless they have electronics to, designed to make them have persistence. So uh, even if we're using Dolly, Dolly is, can take you down to 0.1% of your light output but even 0.1% is still 3 to 10% of the perceived light output. So even what looks like a really impressive drop in dimming may not look like an impressive drop in dimming. So why can't we do better? Because of LEDs and the electronics that make them operate. So there are three basic ways to dim LEDs. Constant current reduction, which means you're reducing the current delivered to the LED. Pulse width modulation, pulse frequency modulation, and I have illustrations of these on the next slide. And you can also change the duty cycle, turning it off, fully off, for example, for some period of the cycle. These can all be combined as a dimming strategy, and some manufacturers of drivers are very clever in combining these techniques to produce deep dimming without flicker, but it's still rare, unfortunately. Uh, and as a complication, pulse width modulation, pulse frequency modulation, and the duty cycle can all produce these artifacts of flicker. And if you use constant current reduction as a technique, that can introduce color shift. So there's no perfect way to, to do it. There on the left, you can see that uh, if you're using constant current, you're basically taking a steady light output and you're just reducing it to a lower and lower level, or as the case may be from top to bottom, you're increasing it from a very low level to a higher level. Alternately, if you're using pulse width modulation, you can turn the light on and off different periods of time in order to change the effect of light output. If you're using pulse frequency modulation, you have the same width of the pulse size. You're just spacing the pulses closer or farther apart. So those are the three ways that are traditionally used for dimming. There are two flicker metrics that are used uh, or discussed in the IES handbook, and they are percent flicker and the flicker index. We've already talked about percent flicker, which has a 0 to 100 percent scale. It's, uh, it does not account for frequency or waveform shape or duty cycle, so it's inadequate. So the other one is a flicker index, which is looking at the area above the average light output divided by the sum of the areas above and below the light output. And that's a little better, but not much. And it's harder to use, and it involves calculus, <coughs> which is terrifying. So as a result, flicker index isn't used as much as percent flicker is. Percent flicker is just a little bit easier mathematically. However, flicker index also does not account for frequency. The IEEE standard that was published in 2015 was a first attempt at coming up with guidelines for avoiding the health consequences of flicker. And they basically took data 
from a variety of studies and they uh, put together this plot based on risk level, probability of exposure, severity of exposure, and they looked at the data reliability of these different studies and they plotted the percent flicker versus the frequency. And percent flicker is also called modulation, percent modulation, by the way. So they plotted this and they showed a level for low risk <clears throat> and for no risk, no effect level, N-O-E-L. And the goal was to have a very simple metric, easy to calculate, easy to understand. And it works, mostly, mostly. It's very conservative. And I can tell you that there are some light sources that I consider perfectly acceptable that don't meet this standard. Now, uh, does that mean that I have the same sensitivity as someone who has epilepsy? No, not necessarily. Uh, but this is a really good first step. However, because it's very conservative, and because it doesn't take into consideration any really oddities in the waveform, it could be improved upon. Now, I was on this committee, so here I am saying I was on this committee and I think it can be improved. But it's easy to apply. You figure out what the fundamental frequency of the flicker is, so we've been looking here at, say, 120 hertz flicker. You multiply that by 0 0.08. You end up with 9.6. Let's round up to 10. We're basically saying if your percent flicker is greater than 10%, some people could have a problem here. And if you want to talk about very sensitive individuals, change that multiplier to 0 0.03. So for example, if you're designing lighting for a school with autistic kids, you would want to err on the side of being conservative. So you would want to go down to 0 0.03 times 120 hertz, which would mean you, you wouldn't want more than uh, one, uh, so about three, 4% uh, flicker. So as a result, we've got an easy standard but it is very conservative. And a lot of manufacturers have said, you know what, I've been producing some products that have been well accepted in the marketplace, and we haven't had problems, so why do we need to meet this, this conservative standard? Well, does a conservative approach suit all applications? Probably not. Um, so there, I will agree there needs to be some modification to this standard, but it was a really, really good first start. There have been some subsequent flicker metrics developed. Actually, one is very old. It's called the uh, flicker meter uh, approach. They basically were looking at electrical systems, trying to figure out how much flicker on the line of an electrical distribution system was acceptable and what wasn't. And that was looking at lower frequency flicker, uh, generally up to about 60 hertz. Uh, in the upper right hand corner you see a plot of what that flicker meter standard produced as a, uh, uh, a level. Everything below is acceptable, everything above is not acceptable. And it's actually been uh, confirmed by the Lighting Research Center, which had an assist document that talked about this low frequency flicker. And they came up with a standard that's actually pretty darn close to the PST standard. So both of those are plotted there, and they're, they're very close. So for this is only for visible flicker. Remember, that's looking directly at it, right? Visible flicker up to 80 hertz and values above 1.0 are considered acceptable in that PST standard. The LRC's um, perception metric is called MP, and it's, it's very simple. Um, it just doesn't use the model of an incandescent lamp. And that also covers frequency from 5 hertz up to 80 hertz. 
Then the folks at Philips in uh, the Netherlands have put a lot of time and study into developing a stroboscopic effect visibility measure, and that's SVM. And that's a measure that you're going to see promoted by NEMA, for example. And it's based on human subjects testing, which was converted into a standard observer. And it predicted the visibility of stroboscopic effect based on wave shape and duty cycles. It covers uh, above 80 hertz. It uses an FFT transform, so that analysis is a little more robust than the simpler approach of the IEEE. A stroboscopic visibility measure value of 1 means that it's just uh, barely visible, and values of higher than 1 are considered more visible. Now, uh, one of the questions that comes up, actually I think I have a bunch of questions there on the right, is does the visibility of the flicker or the stroboscopic effect equate to the neurological response? We don't know. Does the standard observer predict the responses of migraineurs, who are people who suffer from migraines, they don't have to be French, and autists? people who suffer from autism. We don't know. It assumes a fixed head gaze. How often do you have a fixed head gaze for a stroboscopic effect? Doesn't happen for me very often. How realistic is it? Eh, it may cover some applications, but not all. It does not predict <clears throat> the visibility of the phantom array effect. And very often, you're picking up flicker as a result of that phantom array effect. So what are the threshold values of SPM that apply to different kinds of applications? These are all questions we have yet to determine. Uh, the NEMA 77 document that came out in 2017 basically is looking at flicker visibility. It's using the PST standard for low frequency flicker, and it's using the SVM metric for higher frequency flicker. And the argument is we should use an SVM value of 1.6 because lamps have been sold that have an SVM value of 1.6, and no one has complained about it. Got that? Where do you complain? <laughs> okay, so I am willing to say SVM has value. It's a, it's a good metric. It maybe doesn't represent all situations. And in fact, I now know that it does not pick up the stroboscopic, excuse me, it does not pick up the phantom array effect. And that is a, a more prominent effect that you see with higher frequencies. So SVM really does not cover higher frequencies well. Is there anyone else besides me that gets on new aircraft and is driven crazy by the flicker? Woohoo, one of my colleagues is agreeing. Yay! That, with, <laughs> I travel on airplanes and everywhere else I go with a flicker meter these days. So I happen to know what the statistics are. It's about 450 hertz, and it is about, um, what was it? I think it was 80% 80, 80 flicker. So um, if you think you don't see uh, that kind of flicker, obviously Andrea and I are going to uh, duke it out with you. But SVM shows that the flicker value on airplanes is less than one. So theoretically, you and I should not be seeing it. It should not be visible. So what are we learning here? We are learning that all the flicker metrics stink. <laughs> now, if you move your eyes to the right and left, do you see images, multiple images of this stripe? Do any of you pick that up when you move your eyes around? Move your eyes back and forth. Keep your head still. Just move your eyes back and forth. Yeah? yeah. yeah? 
you just saw a phantom array effect and you are picking up the flicker of this projector as a consequence of the phantom array effect. Woohoo! Accomplishment. And there's a, I got this off of the internet. Isn't that a great illustration of the phantom array effect? So we unfortunately have no measures, no metrics for the phantom array effect. But if anyone goes out driving at night and they see either oncoming headlights or taillights that track across your eye, your, your visual field, and you're kind of distracted by it, you're seeing a phantom array effect in spades, guys. So it's a, a severe problem. Uh, can we have a metric that covers both the phantom array effect and the stroboscopic effect? Wouldn't that be nice? Let's hope this happens soon. So specifiers, what do you do? You need to insist on seeing an LED luminaire in operation before specifying it. And you want to see it in a dimmed operation because there's an interaction between the dimmer and the LED. As it's being dimmed, it may amplify the flicker effect, the, the TLA, the temporal light artifact. And you can always use your flicker meter. If you see that kind of series of images, you've got flicker. I travel with my own personal flicker meter right here. So if you see me in an airport and on an airplane or in a restaurant doing this, <laughs> that's Naomi again. Okay, buy a good quality handheld flicker meter. This one's about 700 bucks, I think. But you need to make sure that it measures at least up to 2,000 hertz, preferably higher. Uh, I have to put in a plug. PNNL, at this moment, is testing a whole bunch of handheld flicker meters. So we will be able to report very soon on makes and models of different flicker meters and how well they perform relative to the big honk and desktop or you know lab bench top units. Yes? You know, we have a, lot, a lot of times LEDs are being dimmed by various control devices. So you want to see it in dimmed operation. Do you want to see it in dimmed operation from the various control devices? Will they affect it differently or? Uh... Yes, they will affect it differently. Uh, but, for example, if you're specifying 0 to 10 volt, make sure you're seeing it on a 0 to 10 volt dimmer. Uh, if you're specifying it with a phase cut dimmer, heaven help you. <laughs> if it's on 0 to 10, will it react the same way regardless if it's from the wall dimmer or from a centralized control operation? Come on. One of you should be able to answer this. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I believe that it depends on the control. If it's, for example, DMX or Dolly, it should react the same no matter what control you're using, whether it's in the ceiling or whether it's you know, something handheld on your desk. I believe that 0 to 10 is not one of those consistent it's analog, it's analog but, it's a linear but it's linear, so it probably will be consistent, wouldn't you think? Yeah? Not necessarily, they also have algorithmic 0 to 10, so it's not all linear. They're right, very different to specify. She is right. You have 0 to 10 volt dimmers, some have a logarithmic uh, dimming to output function, and some have a linear, but hopefully that shouldn't affect the flicker of the LED, but do not quote me on that. Are, are we concerned about the low level dimming, the lowest of the low? Because that's, I mean, so whether you're logarithmic, which is what she's saying is correct, but if you're doing logarithmic, linear, square wave, whatever, if you're down to 1%, 2%, the point is you're at the very low end and your, and your uh, driver will be, be presenting a low hertz. No That's what, right. So you should be getting the flicker at a 1% or at the bottom of any dimmer range. That's the most critical range, yes. The so bottom of the dimmer is most critical. However, I made the stupid mistake 
of volunteering to help Bruce Kinsey relight his new house. <laughs> and I specified LED products. And you, you know how you save someone's life and you're always responsible for saving that person's life for the rest of your life? I am now responsible for testing every blessed dimmer on the market trying to fix all the problems. So I would have said that, yeah, it's the low end of the dimmer that you're concerned about. Not on his system. No, it depends on the lamp you're using. So, um, sorry. <laughs> okay, next, specifiers. Become familiar with Flickr metrics. Please encourage manufacturers to publish Flickr metrics on their cut sheets here. Uh, uh, in fact, down here, I think, well, somewhere, I have a list of them. Uh, ask your clients about sensitivity to Flickr. If you are dealing with schools, hospitals, any kind of spaces that might have individuals that have special sensitivities, ask them. Residential clients. I have had residential clients that were severely irritated and had migraines from the under cabinet lights in their kitchen. Ask them if, they're, if they have headaches or migraines, really be cautious about any kinds of products you're specifying. Uh, write language into your specification that will help overcome uh, bad products. And then if you suspect flicker in a sample that you're testing or if you're on a job site, here's a trick. Take your cell phone, set it on slow-mo video. Uh, mine is an iPhone. It's at 240 frames per second. Be sure you know what the frames per second is on your slow-mo. This slows down the flicker rate by a factor of eight and generally helps you see whether there is actual flicker there or not. So film it for five seconds and then play back the video on the phone. Flashing stripes or other artifacts may indicate flicker. Let's show this. This is Bruce Kinsey's house. Oh, where did it go? No play, please. Okay, I'm going to do this. Maybe this will help. Okay. Can you see it? Now, that's 120 hertz flicker, and that's filmed in standard film mode. That's 30 frames per second. Let's take the same scene, and let's play it in slow-mo mode. <laughs> and play it back. Woohoo! All right, so you ask me, yeah, but not all things flicker. What does it look like when it's not flickering? So this is a light fixture in my office. Classy, isn't it? <laughs> and that is the fixture. It's a high-frequency electronically ballasted fluorescent. No flicker. Very nice. But here's another fixture in my office. And this one's lots of fun. Now, you also get the color variation. Isn't that fun? Yeah, pretty strange. Anyway, I, so here I have listed uh, the frequencies and the, uh, the modulation depth or percent flicker from each of these different products so you can see how it's affected by the slow-mo mode. And it also lists the uh, uh, stroboscopic visibility measure, just for your own reference. Notice this electronically ballasted fluorescent has an SVM of 0.02, which is really, really super low. So anyway, that's, that is a trick. So you're going to ask me, does that work all the time? I don't know. It seems to be pretty dang reliable to me, and I've been taking slow-mo video of a lot of different ranges of products, including a wonderful TLA box that generates different kinds of flicker. So 
Um, what I want to say is use this as a really good, reliable indicator, but it's not going to stand up in a court of law, okay? If you see flicker in your video, go get yourself a good quality meter and measure it that way. All right, so next. What you can do if you're a utility and energy efficiency organization is require Flickr documentation, which means publish those Flickr metrics for energy efficiency programs. Make sure that contractors and distributors and energy services providers are aware of the issue. Believe me, I have been in a few retrofitted spaces where the Flickr is just horrendous. <sighs> Some of the hotel rooms that I've been in. I could show you slow-mo videos of hotel task lights that would make your stomach turn. <laughs> <sighs> okay, if you're using standards, you can use the P1789 standard knowing it's not perfect. You can use the NEMA 77 standard also knowing it's not perfect. If you're a manufacturer or representative, be proactive, buy a flicker meter, test for flicker, test over the full dimming range, demand good quality drivers that address these issues. You know which ones they are. Some of them are amazing, really, really good. Okay, publish flicker metrics on, the, on your data sheets, and here are the ones that I recommend so far. These are the ones that people are most used to seeing. And you as specifiers, make sure you understand how to read these values these different metrics. So you now have Flickr on your, web, or on your website. Flickr on your job site. What do you do about it? First thing you do is call the manufacturer and you say, help, put me in touch with your most knowledgeable person about drivers and Flickr and hope you actually get transferred to somebody who actually knows. Sometimes you can change the driver. That's easy to do, right? Sometimes you can change the dimmer. Not always. Sometimes you have to change the friggin' luminaire. Like decorative pendants. Have you seen some of these decorative pendants or chandeliers and the lamps in them? are just annoying as the dickens. Are you going to be able to fix it? Maybe not. Maybe not. So it's not easy to fix it in the field, which is why it behooves all of you to try to get rid of Flickr before it gets into the job site. And this means that you need to be really tough on substitutions, folks. Really tough. Crib notes. So this is your takeaway, right? You ready for the pop quiz? Almost all light sources flicker to some extent. The factors that contribute to it are modulation depth, frequency, duty cycle, and the waveform over time. LEDs aren't the problem. What are? The driver and the electronics are the problem. The LED is not the culprit. The LED is not, is the source of the light output that's flickering, but it's the driver that is really causing the problem. The interaction with the dimmer can make the flicker worse, especially at low levels. All flicker metrics suck. <laughs> There's a wide individual variation in sensitivity to flicker. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't. Responses can range from no response at all to seizures that are very risky to migraines to just irritation. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I just get irritated. <laughs> Setting safe levels is really tricky because we don't have the neurological data. So if any of you have contacts at OHSU with the neurology folks say, we need information on flicker and how it affects us neurologically because we need to set standards. Help us, help us. 
That's what we need most of all. So more important than anything, stay tuned because we're hoping that Flickr metrics will evolve, that the neurological data will evolve, and that the LED industry will evolve to get rid of it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? So I've been bothering Pacific Power for about a year because we're having, uh, on Twitter, so whoever that was, thank you, but also <laughs> I'm still annoyed. But um, how do you know if it's a separation between internal and the grid? Is there any way to know if there's actual load loss coming into the structure versus what's happening inside yep. from the panel? Get one of the fixtures and take it home and plug it in. Okay. Seriously, or, or take it to a laboratory that has a, um, a controlled power supply so that you know that what the power supply being delivered to the product is that it's very consistent in light output. If you still see flicker there, then, then it's probably the product, not the power line. But also, one more thing, sometimes if you see kind of erratic flicker, like flash, 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 that is more likely to be due to power line variations than to a problem inside the driver. Uh, but again, it's going to vary. There's no sure way to determine that unless you start testing it on a, a, some kind of good quality power supply. Can like a solar inverter be messing with that process possibly? You're talking above my pay grade. So ask somebody else in this room. I bet somebody else knows the answer to that. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Back in the uh, magnetic balance, back in the magnetically balanced 60 cycle days, um, there used to be, I guess my question is, are there gender differences? We were given rules of thumb that essentially with 60 cycle flicker, that approximately 10% of females would experience. That seemed to be a pretty good metric, but only one to two percent of males, and that seemed to be a pretty good, you know, metric. Is there any uh, uh, research on that? Yes, and it's true. The reason is that women are more susceptible to migraines and headaches than men are. For whatever reason, our physiology is not helping us out. Uh, but that's not to say that men don't experience migraines. I mean, there's a fellow in our office that has to stay home on a periodic basis because he suffers from such horrible migraines. But yes, so there, there may be a relationship between flicker sensitivity and headache and migraine frequency, and that would probably explain that difference. What I would use as a reference for that is the IEEE standard. And the reason is that they at least address all of the research uh, papers that contributed to that standard. And there's a document that was published in 2000, 
2010, maybe 2011, from the IEEE committee that goes through all of the research papers and basically summarizes what we know and what we don't know about each of the different issues. So that's your best bet. Um, I will tell you that I, a lot of lower cost products for multifamily residences use AC LEDs. Now, I've been told that there are AC LEDs that don't flicker. I haven't met one yet. But there is one in the mail to me. And if I find that it doesn't flicker, you will hear, hear me shouting from the rooftop. So far, I would be extremely nervous about any AC LED products. So if you see products that are advertised as no driver, that means AC LED, be nervous. And maybe that'll change, I hope. Yes? Is there any data uh, that addresses age as it relates to susceptibility to flicker? Good question about age and how it relates to flicker. Um, I think that older people may have, may experience a reduction in sensitivity to flicker, partly because often you're pickering, picking up flicker in the periphery of your vision. And as you grow older, your periphery starts to collapse a little bit. I'm sorry to tell you this. I'm in the same boat. I'm getting older. This is not good, right? But the point is your visual field starts to get reduced. So that may reduce some of the sensitivity to flicker that probably does not affect the neurological response. It just affects your ability to detect it. In your studies, there's, there's several, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I should project, I don't know. No, I know. Oh, okay, well, let's go Um There are a lot of, I don't know, I'm just wondering, in your studies, in, there are a lot of um, companies that, that make um, accessories that, that utilize Flickr that, you know, and you can see them on bicycle wheels or car wheels, you know, if you have a jacked up car, you can put these things that make your car wheels look like they're standing still and it's going 60 miles an hour and so on. Do yeah. they ever cause any problem? Yes. I have been contacted by two people now who are suffering seizures from 120 hertz flicker. Now, this isn't supposed to happen, but uh, one of the individuals can no longer leave her house because bus tail lights, uh, any kind of uh, flashing lights on uh, bicycles, depending on the frequency, um, airline cabin lighting, she can no longer fly on, on airplanes, she's encountering more and more places, uh, car tail lights, that are causing her to have seizures. So she's basically locked into her, her house at this point. How many people are experiencing this? I have no idea. I don't think it's widespread. I think it's a very small number of people. But the answer is yes. And people may not be able to attribute their response to the flicker. They may not even see that it's flickering. That's the sinister part of this. Let's hope that the number of people going through that kind of neurological response is very small. Robert. First, just let everyone know there are bars in Portland that our group is no longer allowed in because we all sit down there and start going like this. <laughs> what are you doing here? Get out of here. <laughs> just, uh, just thinking out loud for a second and, and wanted to get you know, other opinions on this. The question about zero to 10 volt. Um, I mean, I think it's about what the driver does, right? So zero to 10 volt just tells the driver what to do, but how the driver does that is independent of zero to 10 volt, right? Um, and so that's where the, you know, is it, is it a constant wattage reduction or is it a PWM? What, what's the driver doing? And that, that also makes me wonder, Naomi,
No, what I would do is to say use one of these well-engineered drivers that we know eliminates flicker. Uh, and I could use a brand name that you would all recognize and uh, I know that unless you go down to extremely low levels with these <coughs> drivers, extremely low, that you're not going to be uh, delivering flicker through the light source. So that's probably the best solution. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend is daylight. Is that a good answer to your question? I don't think we should eliminate LEDs from our specifications out of fear of flicker. No, I was asking a constant wattage reduction dimming of LEDs. As long as it doesn't go so low that you start to have color shift and other weirdnesses, yes, I think a CWA solution might work. And then just a comment on the, you know, the question, I mean, the problem manufacturers have is, most you know, you know you, put multiple drivers available with every luminaire out there, right? And so every one of those drivers is going to have different performance. It then becomes a question of how much testing do they have to do, right? And, and then not only a question of that driver at full output, but you want to know what that driver is doing at all these dim levels, right? So getting information from manufacturers, I wouldn't put a lot of hope in that in the near future, right? It's just because I don't know how they're going to do it. Um, so that's, that's a tough challenge. Hopefully the driver manufacturers start to do more of that, but then there's an interaction with the dimmer, right? So, Well, I will just share the, another experience from Bruce Kinsey's house. Uh, we ultimately gave up on a dedicated LED track product and ended up putting in MR16 holders and putting in LED MR16s, and I thought, well, you know, you, that's easy. You just look up on the the LED MR16 website and they have these compatibility tables, right? I've been through every friggin' dimmer on their list and none of it fixes the flicker. So, uh, yeah, manufacturers must be wrestling with a terrible problem here and even if they publish compatibility, make sure that that compatibility includes flicker. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes they'll tell you how low it'll dim, but they won't necessarily tell you whether there's flicker as you dim it. I'm sorry, did I, I stepped in front of somebody else's question, I think. No, I, I guess my question was, yeah, I was along those lines in terms of, I mean, I feel like everybody's saying that the driver, that the dimmer has nothing to do with it, but I feel like it does, like depending on what dimmer, just because I see it on my samples, right? Like if I have a sample that just has a cheap sort of 10 volt dimmer on it, it functions differently than if it has a high quality sort of 10 volt dimmer attached to it. So I don't think that we can completely blame the driver. I think, you know, when, when my customers ask me, what can I do to minimize the effects? Usually one of my first suggestions is, spend the money to buy a really good dimmer, right? If you're not gonna do a dimming system, spend the money to buy the $100 dimmer on the wall because mm -hmm. I, I, I experience tells me that it helps. It doesn't necessarily fix it, but I feel like it helps. I don't think we can take away all the responsibility from the dimmer just because it's zero temple. I think there is responsibility on that side too. Yes, and test it. And all you need to hear from me is, yes, you need to do more work to make these systems Successful in the field, right? Oh, question. You're talking yes, you were talking, and then you mentioned it at the end. The only thing that I can think about is we need more of these collaborations, like what we've done with Joan Roberts, where you know, we bring in somebody who's an actual doctor in neurology and do research with that person. How close are we as a lighting industry to finding those connections with people that's just you and doing? joint research, right? Where we're bringing in the lighting information and they're bringing in the scanning and the MRIs or the whatevers we need to do to figure out a way to test this in real life. The best hope I have is Jennifer Veach, who is a researcher at the National Research Council of Canada. She has the physiology background and she works with <coughs> neurologists to try to uh, come up with experiments that will test these kinds of things. Uh, at this point in time, we at PNNL can't test this because you don't want to be exposing someone who might end up with seizures 
to a flicker situation, right? Because we're not medical doctors. But if we could collaborate with medical doctors to make sure that, that we know what the stimulus is and we know how to measure it and we know how to, to write the paper at the end, but we have some physicians in the middle who can help us get IRB approval, find suitable uh, subjects for the testing, that would be ideal. So Jennifer Veach is doing that in Canada. Uh, I'm hoping that groups in the United States will do similar things. Collaboration is the important uh, word. So yes. do you guys have some, uh, do you have some people that would be willing to work? Because uh, Jeremy and my husband and I were talking about sleep you know, studies and, uh, and uh, Kaiser Foundation has a lot of, well, I, I, I can't speak, speak for them, but he said that if you know some people that are interested in research and lighting and how they affect it, get connected with them and, you know, you can take it from there. So if that's something that you're interested in, I can talk to him and see connect you, you know, that's potentially something that... Sold. That'd be great, Ella. Thanks. Good. I think you guys all need to get back to work. <laughs> Thank you.